the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is Shiloh Missionary Baptist Church, the Lord's church for God's love and the word transform lives. And I'm so glad you decided to join us in the sanctuary this morning for our morning worship. Let us stand, receive our deacons, and join them in our morning devotion. Oh, I'm glad to be in the service. I'm glad to be in the service. I'm glad to be in the service. One more time. Well, he didn't have to let me. Oh, he didn't have to let me. Yes, I'm glad. Shiloh, glad to be in the service one more time. I've chosen for our scripture reading this morning, Psalms 111. Psalms 111. It reads, praise ye the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the unright upright and in the congregation. The works of the Lord are great, sought out of all men that have pleasure therein. His work is honorable and generous, and his righteousness endures forever. He has made his wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. He has given meat unto them that fear him. He will ever be mindful of his covenant. He has shown his people the power of his works, that he may give them the heritage of the heathen. The works of his hands are verity and judgment. All his commandments are sure. They stand fast forever and ever and are done in truth and uprightness. He sent redemption unto his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and reverend is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do his commandments. His praise endureth forever. Amen. We have prayer by Deacon Gilbert Wilhite. Dear Heavenly Father, it's once more again that we come to you as humble as we know how. Thank you for these many blessings, dear Father. Thank you for waking us up, letting us see a brand new day. Thank you for bringing us through this week, dear Heavenly Father, through the highways and byways, dear Heavenly Father. Bless Shiloh as a whole. Bless all the sick and shed in, dear Father. Dear Heavenly Father, and bless the people in New York, dear Heavenly Father. You know what they need and you know what they stand in need of, dear Heavenly Father. Dear Father, bless them, dear Father. Then bless Shallow as a whole. These are many blessings I ask in your name. Amen. I know the Lord will make a way. Oh, yes, he will. How about y'all? Oh, I know the Lord make a way oh yes he will oh he'll make a way for me and for you oh you gotta do it just trust him he will see you through Go away. 
have our altar prayer. God is able to deal with any situation or circumstance. I heard a young man say these words yesterday and they still resonate with me. Your situation can't change God's word, but God's word can change your situation. Your situation doesn't change the promises of God. Your situation doesn't change the benevolence of God. Your situation doesn't change the sovereignty of God. Your situation doesn't change the ability of God. But God sure can move in our situation. And we come to the altar of prayer to allow God to move in our situation. Bring our hearts, our minds, our spirits to the altar. So we're just going to ask you to stand where you are. Stand where you are as we approach the throne of Christ. Whatever it is you're dealing with, whatever circumstance you're dealing with, take it to the Lord. Father God, we come right now just to say thank you. Thank you, Father, for waking us up this morning. Thank you, Father, for closing us this morning. Thank you, Father, for letting us be in our right mind, Father. Thank you, Father. You didn't have to do it, but you did. Thank you for each and every day, each and every heartbeat. Thank you, Father. Thank you for homes. Thank you for transportation. Thank you for family. Thank you for friends. Thank you for making a way out of nowhere. Thank you, Father. They say if I had a thousand tongues, I couldn't thank you enough. But we want to just come and give you the praise and the honor that you were due. The mighty and awesome God who created the heavens and the earth. Separated the land from the sea, who placed every animal and every seed bearing plant on this earth. An awesome God who's walked with us through generation after generation. And now, as we come to this day and this time, this era in which we live by, now that it's our time, our time to live, to work and to serve you in your kingdom, Father. We come and commit our lives to you, Father. Because we understand that you are an awesome God. An awesome God who can provide all things that we need through your grace. Your grace is sufficient. And we just trust in you, Father. Somebody stands in need of a financial blessing today, Father. I don't know who it is, but you can bless them. Somebody stands in need of a healing today, Father, and you can bless them. Somebody needs comfort in their heart, Father. Somebody needs peace in their home, Father, and you can bless them. You know what each of us stand in need of, and I just call on you, Father, just to bless each and every person at the point of their need. You're able, Father. We know that you're able. We're just asking that you will. In the mighty and precious name of Jesus. And all the believers said, Amen. Amen. Give God some praise in this house. Glory to his name. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Is out there wonderful? Oh, wonderful change. Thank you. 
that we're still here today. Give him some glory, some honor, and some praise. Open up your mouth and just tell him thank you.
the long name Jesus no now No, 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 not one, cause Jesus, he knows oh, all about our struggles, and if you believe he will guide until the day. Not one friend, lie, 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 the Lord, leave Jesus. No, not one. No, 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 no. Not one. Can you be a friend like Jesus? Ah, what a challenge for the Christian community today. To try to be a friend like Jesus. If we're going to be Christ-like, we ought to try to be friends like Jesus. Amen. That's a lifelong ambition. Praise the Lord. There is a word from the Lord today. We, I don't often go to the Old Testament, but today we're going to go to the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah, first chapter. We're going to begin at verse number one. God's word for God's people, Nehemiah. Give you a second. I know we don't go to the Old Testament much. You might have to hunt for it a little bit. Nehemiah, the prophet. Well, he really wasn't a prophet, but he's in the book of the prophets. Since he, he got elevated, amen? God can elevate you. Doesn't matter where you start. Sister Marie is where you finish. Nehemiah 1, beginning at verse number 1. I'm only going to read four verses, but I would have you read the entire passage. And in the entire book of Nehemiah is only 13 chapters, not very long. You can read the entire book of Nehemiah. Uh, if you would do so, the next uh, few weeks will be helpful. Amen. Nehemiah 1, beginning at verse number 1. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, and it came to pass in the month of Sheshlu, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the palace, that Hananiah, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped which were left of the captivity and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, the remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Nehemiah, Nehemiah. Let me tell you a little bit about Nehemiah before we uh, get into the text here. Uh, I just want to tag this text today, give it a title, When You Care. 
Hold on to that when you care. Nehemiah translated means Yahweh has comforted. He had a perfect name that, uh, that defined who he is. God has comforted. Nehemiah offers people hope. And when you look at the life of Nehemiah and you consider all of what he went through from where he started to where he finished, you can have hope too. The book of Nehemiah gives us a good guidebook over how to deal with our troubles and, and how to deal with our trouble, not just by having a good plan, but by trusting God. It's always good to have a plan, but it's better that your plan is established by God and that you trust God for the plan. Oftentimes we come up with our own plans uh, and then we have to make our plans happen. But guess what? When you do what God calls you to do, it's on God, not on you. And God is not short in his word or his promise. Nehemiah had uh, the right character, the character that all of us should embody. Uh, Nehemiah had a strong prayer life. He had a good reason to be praying. You got to understand that Nehemiah was in Babylon. Nehemiah was part of the children that had been taken from Israel, taken from Jerusalem and moved to Babylon. He was a captured, uh, basically he was a slave in a foreign land, let's just say it. Sometimes we don't like to talk about slavery. Somehow we think that that heritage of slavery is, is something to be ashamed of, but we didn't really put ourselves in slavery. Well, I guess according to the Bible, the Israelites, by their behavior, they earned their position. But it wasn't something personal that Nehemiah did. It was a whole collective of people because God had had enough. And he needed to teach them a lesson. But in the teaching of them a lesson, he teaches us a lesson. About how God, even in his chastisement, still keeps us. Mm -hmm. Still comforts us. Still prospers us. As long as what? We don't run from God. See, some people in their chastisement, in, in going through what they go through, Brother Bruce, they, they run from God. When we get a whooping that we've actually earned, now we think God don't love us. When daddy and mama give us that whooping that we already earned, we want to run away and run out of the house and and go hide at auntie's house or uncle's house or just down the street with our friends. We, we run, but you can't run from God. Nehemiah exhibited a prayer life. He exhibited the exercise of leadership when he was called on. He exhibited faithfulness to God. We have to remain faithful to God through every situation. One of the things that's pointed out in this very first chapter, and really one of the main focuses of today's message, is that prayer and fasting changes things. Amen. Say it again, sister. Prayer and fasting changes things. Go ahead and try it and see what happens when you really pray and fast. If you really want to see the movement of God, go ahead and pray and fast. And when you pray and when you fast, it's not about what you tell God, it's about what you hear from God. Amen. There are a lot of lessons in the book of Nehemiah. Lessons about prayer, lessons about leadership, lessons about overcoming obstacles, Lessons about restoring hope in other people. Lessons about personal integrity and holiness. Read the book of Nehemiah. I know it's Old Testament. And we got a lot of New Testament 
men that we could look at, but Nehemiah is a great example about what happens when men work together. When we come together for our community, for all of our benefits, not just my benefit. Nehemiah recognizes the importance of his calling. Nehemiah recognized the importance of prayer. Nehemiah recognized the importance of being patient and hopeful. Nehemiah recognized the importance of being prepared in planning. Nehemiah recognized the importance of being the kind of leader who could inspire others to join in the work. Nehemiah recognized that obstacles will come, but just because obstacles and enemies come up against you, you don't stop doing what you're doing for the Lord. Amen. Nehemiah teaches us the importance of integrity. Nehemiah teaches us the importance of relationships and reconciliation. This book is full of lessons, not from a prophet, but from a man who had been enslaved in Babylon. You understand that Nehemiah was the cupbearer, and it sounds like a, a fancy title, and he worked in the king's house. He was the king's cupbearer, but that meant he was a servant in the king's kitchen. He was the one who was called upon to bring the king his drink and make sure it wasn't poisoned before he got it. It was a dangerous position. It was somebody, uh, he was the kind of servant that the king had to trust. Kings were always afraid that somebody was trying to dethrone them. So Nehemiah had to be somebody whom he trusted. That if somebody tried to poison the king, Nehemiah would take the poison first. And that he wouldn't be compromised and put the poison in there for somebody else. He was a cupbearer. He was a cupbearer. But he was a man of integrity and he was a man who cared. Mm -hmm. When we examine the text today, uh, Nehemiah, this is his memoirs. He's writing about his life. He's writing about what happened to him. And he begins in the month of Kislev. It's autumn. In the 20th year of King Arzaeus. He was at the palace. He was doing his job in the palace. And some men came from Jerusalem. Some of his brethren came from Jerusalem. And when they came, he asked them how things were back home. You know how it is. You know, when family comes up from Mississippi or Kentucky or Alabama or wherever you are, you ask them, how are things at home? I don't care how long you lived in Indianapolis, the boy. That's still home. And you are still concerned and care about what's going on at home. And Nehemiah was concerned. So when his brethren showed up, he asked about those who had escaped captivity, those who were still left in Jerusalem. Because you, you understand the Babylonians took siege to Jerusalem. They tore down the walls. They burnt the gates. And, and they didn't take everybody to Babylon. They left some in place. They took the princes. They took the high society folks. But they left some other folks in place. They took young people. They raped the land of their youth. And Jerusalem was now in great distress. And these men who come and talk to Nehemiah, the first point I want to make is that when you care, the first thing you do is ask about somebody else. When you really care about your community, you ask questions about the condition that we're really in when you care. And, and Nehemiah, he asked. He didn't even ask them how they were doing. He asked about Jerusalem. And you know, oftentimes when people ask us how we're doing, uh, we got a smile on our face. It doesn't matter what trouble is in our life. 
I'm okay. Blessed by the best. We put on our best face, don't we? But what's good about this situation is that these men were willing to tell Nehemiah the truth. And number two, that Nehemiah was willing to hear the truth. When you care, you're willing to really listen and hear what's going on. Not just to brush it off like it's another news story. Not just to brush it off like, well, tomorrow's come. Tomorrow will come. It'll be sunnier tomorrow. Things will get better. I wish you the best. Because y'all know sometimes we hear from people and, and they're not doing well. And we pat them on the back and see you tomorrow. When you care, you really hear the truth. And it impacts you when you hear about somebody's physical condition or mental condition and understand uh, what it means for the walls to be torn down. What it means for the gates to be burned. For the city of Jerusalem, what it meant was there was no protection from thieves and robbers. There was no protection from jackals and wolves. There was no protection for the people of the city because the walls and the gates is what kept the enemy and the world out. When our walls and our gates are torn down, if, if you begin to think about it and, and put that metaphor into your own life personally, any of your walls been torn down? Any of your gates been burned? Any of the things that you're used to protecting you and keeping you, have they been removed? Have they been damaged? Has death and destruction put gaps in your walls? I don't mean to bring up too much sadness today, but I know some of us are missing friends and family. There's some people who stood in the gap for us. They filled those voids who helped with our safety and our protection. And we feel like we're in a dangerous situation. But I come to encourage you that there are others who do care. Christians, the church, the people of the church are people who care. Real Christians care. And Nehemiah is a prime example of somebody who really cared. And I want to use him as an example because when you care, you ought to understand there's some things that you go through when you care. And it's okay to go through these things when you care. The first thing that Nehemiah did because he cared when he heard the truth about the condition of his hometown, he sat down. His friends came to him and they were probably standing and having a conversation, but he cared so much and was so impacted by what they had said that he had to sit down. Mm -hmm. Has anybody said to you before they told you something, are you sitting down? <laughs> Because what I'm about to tell you is probably going to knock you off your feet. I want you to sit down. Uh, and, and sometimes sitting down is what we have to do. Because you know what? When we sit down, we stop running around. When we sit down, we take some time to talk to the Lord. When we sit down, we stop what we're already doing to attend to the message we just heard. Nehemiah, step number one here is he sat down. And when he sat down, he cried. The Bible says he wept, he cried. He cried out loud about what he had just heard. We've got to allow what's going on to really affect us. I, I think sometimes we become so insulated, so jaded. We've heard it so many times that it doesn't affect us anymore when we hear about another murder in the streets. When we hear about another young black man who has been gunned down or found in an alley, we, we've heard it so many times. 
It doesn't hit us the way it ought to every time. We've heard about police violence and, and people being dying in the custody of the police. We've heard it so many times, we don't cry anymore. But we ought to. Nehemiah wept and cried and mourned. He grieved. Now understand something about grief. Grief is a process. When we say we mourn, uh, one of the things that, that I know about grief that some people don't understand is you get angry. You feel guilty. There are seven stages of grief that you will go through. And sometimes you don't even know that you're grieving when you're angry. There are situations that we go through that, that we're dealing with, but because we're mourning, because we're grieving, the guilt and the anger and the anguish, it's not just sadness. Mourning is not just sadness. It's not just depression. We go through this cycle of pain when we grieve. And the Bible says that uh, Nehemiah went through this for days. He was dealing with this, not just in the moment. And many of us are dealing with situations for days. Our grief cannot overtake us if we follow what Nehemiah did. Because he followed his grieving, his mourning with fasting and prayer. Because I always tell you, no matter what situation you're going through, no matter what trial or tribulation you're going through, it's just an opportunity for a testimony about what God's about to do. But if you want to truly know what God's about to do, you're going to have to fast and pray. Yeah. It's really the critical two steps of the plan that Nehemiah presents to us is the fasting and the prayer. He sat down, he wept, he mourned, but he did not mourn as one who had no hope because he knew a God in heaven. He knew a God in heaven who, in spite of the fact, Nehemiah admits, I'm a sinner. My family is a sinner. My people are sinners. We've disobeyed, Lord, your commandments. We've disobeyed your statutes. We've disobeyed your instructions. Yes, we deserve just what we're getting. But we know you're a forgiving God. We know you're a God who said, if my people who are called by my name would turn from their wicked ways, humble themselves and pray. We know that you are the God who wrote that word and you are a God who keeps his word, because you are that very God, I'm calling on your name right now. He fasted and he prayed and he fasted and he prayed and he fasted and he prayed. And you don't particularly see it in the text. But when you fast and pray, you hear from God. And this is the importance of the calling. Many of us pray waiting for God to do something. But when you pray, God will tell you to do something. That's what we call a calling. There's, there's more callings than being called to preach, Bishop. That's right. So many people are, are waiting on a call to preach, but there's more callings than a call to preach. Every time God calls on you, it's a calling. Have you thought about it? If you haven't thought about it, let me get you to think about it. You were born into this world with a purpose. More importantly, you were born into this world with a godly purpose. God has intended for you to do something from the very beginning. God has always known your purpose and he holds his, your purpose in his heart. And he's trying to get his purpose into your heart. And every situation and every circumstance and everything that you've ever been through is preparing you 
for what God has for you to do. That's why Romans says, all things work for the good to those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Whatever you're going through, if you love God and you're answering your call, it's working for your good. That illness you went through is working for your good. That job you lost, Marie, is working for your good. <laughs> you thought it was the best thing that you ever had, but it's working for your good. That home you lived in that got condemned and you had to move or got foreclosed on, whatever the circumstances, it's working for your good. God is working for your good. When you care, because God cares. God cares for us. When you care, when you think about it, I told you to think about your personal life. Uh, what are, where are the walls and the gates? But what about our community? Because Nehemiah is coming to Jerusalem to help rebuild the community for the people. When we look at our community, when we look at Indianapolis, when we look at our circumstances, what is the condition of our city? Have we really sat down and taken a real hard look? Community violence all around us. They closed Central State and tore it down. Mental health crisis all around us. Economic disparities. Uh, studies have shown in this city alone that black men and black women with the same education as white women and white men make 15 to 25% less in salary just because of the color of our skin. And those economic disparities, they, they ripple through our community because we can't buy the same house, even though we got the same families. We can't buy and deal with the same inflation, even though we live in the same community. And I don't have to mention, I know all of you are good tithers, but guess what? That's 15 to 25% less that the black church has to work with. Amen? You're still giving your tithes. But if you were making what some other people were making, you might have a little bit more left over to do the work that God is calling us to do. There are economic disparities and racism that, is, that we're dealing with in our city. There are health care disparities in our city. In the distribution of health care services. If you just notice Look at where they build the mall. Look at where they build the medical buildings. Look at, at where they build the hospitals. Our access to the services is different. These are walls and gates in our city that affect our safety, our security, our prosperity. And have we looked at dealing with the broken walls, the gates that are on fire? And there are people out there actually starting new fires, trying to burn down what's left. When you care, you listen to what Nehemiah did and you sit down and you weep, you mourn, you fast and pray. You talk to God and ask him, how can I help? What can I do? Nehemiah was a slave and a cupbearer. He, he wasn't in a position really to do what? But he talked it over with the Lord. And I believe from the text we learned that the Lord said, you know what, Nehemiah, you may not seem to believe that you are much, but you know some people. You work for some people that got some power. 
You work for some people that control some resources, but you know what? I control the cattle on a thousand hills. And I control the people who control the resources. And like Moses, uh, you know, God told Moses to go see Pharaoh. God told Nehemiah, go see the king. And I, I imagine what we hear in Nehemiah's prayer is, well, Lord, you want me to go see the king? I hear your calling. I hear what you're telling me to do. But please, Lord, go with me. Make the king favorable and dispose. I got you, Nehemiah. All I need you to do is go. And in this age, I believe that God is speaking the same to every member of the body of Christ. He wants you to go. You just need to figure out what he wants you to go and do. But you first, before you can even talk to him, you got to care. You really got to care. Because God is only going to send people who really care, who have the character, the faithfulness, and are willing to trust God to go. He doesn't need people who are going to start stuff and quit. He doesn't need people who, when they run into trouble, are going to be like, ah, oh, that's no, 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 that's not for me. He, he needs faithful people who will trust him that no matter what obstacle you come up against, you go to him in prayer and let him deal with your obstacle. When Nehemiah was going to rebuild the wall, there was enemies standing there in the city telling him, no, you can't do that. <laughs> you didn't come from out of town. You think you know something, but this is our spot. Troublemakers trying to stir up trouble to keep him from doing what he was called to do. But Nehemiah said, I know a man. Do you know a man? Do you know somebody who can make a way out of no way? Do you know somebody who can give you strength? Who you can say, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. Do you know a man? Who has given you his Holy Spirit. Who has empowered you. Endowed you. With the talents and the ability. To carry out whatever he's called you. To do. Just need you to be sure. That you really care. About God's people. And accomplishing. What God wants accomplished. Not what you want. Accomplished. Too often we try to get God. To support our plan instead of us figuring out what God's plan is and do that because that's where the Lord is in his plan and when we line our plans up with his plan I always say if we agree with God we cannot disagree with each other so let us Look at the condition of our city. Let us seriously go into fasting and praying for our city. We see that there are walls that are broken down. We see that we have a mental health crisis. We see that there's black on black crime. We see there's police violence against black children. We see there are economic disparities. We see there's a health care crisis in our city. And so much more. Teenage suicide rates are escalating. Domestic violence in our city is escalating. Prostate cancer, breast cancer, all of those diseases are ravaging our city. We're still dealing with COVID and more so in black and brown communities than in white communities. There's so much that is going on, but God's people, can make a difference. Let us have a season of fasting, praying, hearing from God, 
Read Nehemiah because once he heard from God, he began to share what God said. God's word is in you. Share it with somebody. I know it's in the book, but God is speaking to this generation right now, trying to direct us and guide us so that we can deal with the crisis that face us. I don't know where the next Nehemiah is in this audience. Or the next Esther. But I know he and she are right here. When you care, you'll let God use you for his service. God bless you. God keep you. May heaven smile upon you. Love God. Love people. Make disciples. God bless you. We extend the invitation to Christian discipleship. We extend the invitation to Christian discipleship. You can come by letter, by candidate for baptism or Christian experience. By letter, maybe you're coming from another church and you want to bring your testimony of service from your past. He will give you bread. And you brought a letter with you to let us know you just didn't get in this game. You've been working in the church for a long time. But you can come with your Christian testimony. You don't have to bring a letter. Come on. We trust you at your word. Or maybe you're new to the kingdom never been baptized and you want to be baptized we love to baptize you here in Shiloh Missionary Baptist Church we baptize on the first Sunday but we need you to come before first Sunday so that the water will be ready when it's time to baptize Man, anybody know what time it is? It's giving time. Hallelujah. Somebody give God some praise. And somebody knows that this is the best part of the service when I can give. Now, some of you have already given. You've mailed it in. You've dropped it in the mailbox. You used Giveify and gave online. Uh, uh, some of you dropped it in the tithing box as you came through the door. But if you haven't done it and you're ready to give now, we're going to give on the way out. There'll be a basket. They'll be holding a basket at the end of the, at the, at the exit. Put your offering in that basket. Amen. Please use an envelope. Envelopes are located in the back of the church. Uh, Usher can bring you an envelope if you raise your hand. Um, but please use an envelope. If you do put cash in the basket, we simply use that for benevolent. Amen? Amen. We thank you for all of your giving. I love the way Shiloh is giving. We are able, and, and understand something, Shiloh. When I talk about these things, uh, these are all areas that Shiloh members, somebody is working in. Amen? And if you don't know who's working in that area, you give me a call if that's on your heart to participate. If you want to join up with the leaders who are working in mental health, community violence, economic, health areas, if you want to join the team, just let me know, and I'll put you in contact with the right people. Amen? Because if God has put it on your heart, he's made it possible to accomplish these things through the church. Because God loves his people. Amen? Amen. God bless you. God keep you. Let me put some emphasis on the fact that we're going to have a uh, Shiloh cleanup day, May the 28th, May the 28th, Shiloh cleanup day, inside and out. Uh, we haven't completed the list of things and projects. See something, say something. Talk to Brother Boyd, uh, Chairman of the Trustee Board, Deacon McCoy, or myself. Uh, if you see something that you'd like to get on the list, um, there are some things we just need to get taken care of, and maybe there's somebody here 
or we can get somebody to take care of. We want to do a Shiloh cleanup day inside and out. We've got some pews that need mending. I know some of y'all know how to sew. Uh, we want to polish the wood. We want to make sure all the windows are inside and out clean. We want to put down some more mulch and plant some flowers. Uh, we just want to do some things to do some detail work. Uh, even there's some stuff that that's accumulated up here we got to get rid of. Amen? Amen. So we want to do a, a Shiloh cleanup day. Amen? May the 28th. That's Saturday. May the 28th. It's in your bulletin, 9 a.m. Uh, please, everybody, if we could come out and work together. Amen? Somebody said that's somebody else's job. No, that's our. Because this is what? Our church. Amen? I know it's the Lord's church, but we are his children in this place. Amen? We are the hands and feet of God in this place. So please come out, help us uh, get some things together, lend a hand. Even if you all you do is take a trash bag out to the dumpster, you can help. Amen? Amen. Amen. God bless you. God keep you. Um, June, uh, in June, we are coming up with our church anniversary. And I know many of you have already given and we say thank you. We thank each and every one for all that you're doing for our church anniversary. Also in June, we're going to start noonday Bible study in person again. And I know some of you who don't like to get online, uh, we're going to have noonday in person at 12 noon. Amen? Amen. Uh, evening Bible study will rem remain online. Morning uh, Bible study and prayer meeting will be in person and online. Amen? Amen. Something for everybody. And I wish that everybody would join in at least one of those on Wednesday worship. If you, if you can't show up in person, at least dial in at 7 a.m. or 6 p.m. Amen. 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 Sister Annie Baker. Sister Annie Baker. Sister Annie Baker in the house. Make your, make your way up to the front of the Sanctuary, please. Sister Diane House, would you come up also, please? Sister Diane House, I believe you're the treasurer for the district nurses, correct? Amen. Sister Marie, you got your camera on your phone? Thank you, ma'am. You ready? Everybody's ready. On Wednesday morning at the Union District Missionary Baptist Association's annual session, we were blessed by the nurses to present to Annie Baker in recognition of her dedicated service to the Union District nurses the Grundy Award, which is the highest award of honor from the Union District Nurses. Father God, we come right now to say thank you. Thank you for your love, your kindness, your grace, and your mercy. Thank you for another day's journey. Thank you for the work you've placed into our hands. Continue to lead God and direct us in the way that we should go. We love you, we honor you, we give you all the praise. Now as we come to depart this place, but never to depart from your presence. May the love of Christ, the grace of God, the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with each and every believer. And every believer said, Amen, Amen, Amen. Go in peace!